the audience was, are there any other organisms that have managed to sort of hack their system or that don't age or, you know, stay young in some way? Can you elaborate on some of the things we've seen in that area? Yeah, that, there are. So we know uh, it's not just to, to, to fight that argument that it's not natural or whatnot. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of, excuse me, a lot of species that are better than us at this. Uh, and they've managed to maintain this system. And we see that in bowhead whales and aspen trees that can live in that case for thousands of years, that these longevity genes that we have, but we don't keep on unless, you know, even, even with exercise and diet, we can't keep them on forever. Uh, we've lost that ability. Whereas these long lived species we think are just lucky enough, or at least have evolved to keep them on short lived species, you know, take a, a large dog, for example, or your pet cat, they're unfortunate because their longevity systems are switched off even more than us. So it's very sad, but I think that we all have the capability. The same with this reset switch. There are species that um, can live forever. There are jellyfish that can respawn and become young again. And we know this is possible in mammals because we can clone mammals. In fact, there's no reason why we couldn't cl clone a human if it were ethical and allowed. What that means is the instructions to build a new organism are still in our bodies. We're just not turning it on when we're adults. So what I think is going on is that species like these bowhead whales and particularly the jellyfish and maybe salamanders that can grow new limbs and lizards that grow new tails. Or lobsters even. Yeah, lobsters. There's negligible senescence, we call it. They don't age. They keep these systems on. And now we're finally learning with modern technology how to turn these systems on like they do. Glenda, did you have a couple of questions for David? Yes, a couple, but uh, what you've discussed so far has been extremely interesting. I just had two maybe small questions. Um, David, I think you said in the book that uh, there are universal regulators of aging. Uh, in, uh, does every human have some of these aging regulators and do super agers have more of them? Oh, good questions. Uh, I should be jotting these down. Uh, tell me <laughs> if I forget to get to all of them. We, we have a recording. Great. Uh, so the simple answer is uh, we all have these genes. They're, they go all the way back to little worms and, and yeast cells. But we have different variations of them. And some people are very lucky. They have, there's one called FOXO3. And some people have variants of FOXO3, changes in the DNA code that protect them without having to exercise and diet. They're, luck, they're the lucky ones. And those people are the, the super agers. They can you know, smoke and, and are immune to it. Whereas most of us, we don't have that benefit. Uh, we can't say, oh, just because someone lived to 100, smoking me means we can all do that. We're not lucky genetically. Um, the good news, though, is that only about 20 to 30% of our longevity and health in old age is inherited. We know this from twins who live very different lives. Um, and twins can live very different lifespans by living differently. And so this is what epigenetic means. It means that your DNA is not necessarily your whole destiny. You can make the best of the genes that you've been given. Um, and that's part of the exciting thing is that aging is malleable and that it's not so much the genetic code that only determines your lifespan. It's how those genes are controlled, the so-called epigenome that can be reset now.